Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at another video by the folks over at AIG. In this one, they try to convince themselves that observational science and historical science are two different things. Well, they kind of are, if by historical science you just mean the study of human history, but they try to apply that to things like radiometric dating by using analogies to human history. And as we will see, it doesn't go so well. So let's go. Have you ever heard this? Billions of years ago, there was an explosion in space. Yes, but only from creationists. People who have even a rudimentary knowledge of the Big Bang Theory will tell you that it was an expansion of space, not an explosion in space. Or a hundred thousand years ago this happened, or that happened, or even in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Question, how does anyone know? By following the evidence. There's plenty of evidence out there for things that no human was there to witness. Not having a witness does not invalidate the rest of the physical evidence. I mean, was anybody there to observe it? Well, actually somebody was, but I'm getting ahead of myself. How do you know that somebody was there to observe it? Was there someone there to observe the observation? How do you know it wasn't someone making up a story and writing it down hundreds or thousands of years after the supposed event? Well, you don't. And there's plenty of evidence to suggest that that's exactly what happened, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Check this out. First of all, we need to recognize that there is a huge difference between observational science and historical science. Not to the scientific community, it's all observational. Except for actual human history, in which case we usually have to find several sources on the same event and use heavy analysis of the sources to determine which parts are accurate and which are embellishments. As far as the physical sciences go, it's all observational. We may not directly observe an event, but we do directly observe all of the evidence of that event. Both are valuable, but very different. Let's define the two real quick, shall we? Observational science is simply when we observe something and experiment to draw conclusions. For instance, when we observe how fast certain isotopes decay and experiment to see if anything can change that decay rate, find that nothing does, and then use those isotopes to determine the ages of certain samples, using different isotopes depending on the sample because of the limitations that we observe when experimenting on them. Sounds good to me. It involves repeatable experimentation and observations in the present. Sure. Experiments on materials in the present to determine what happened to those materials in the past. Makes sense to me. It's through observational science that we find cures for diseases and build space shuttles, stuff like that. And also how we know the age of the Earth and universe. We can directly observe the cosmic microwave background radiation with microwave telescopes. We directly observe galaxies and directly measure their redshift and use calculations with known constants, such as the speed of light in a vacuum, to find out how long it took the light to reach us. All this observational science tells us that the universe has to be several orders of magnitude older than the six to 10,000 years that you guys claim. Now, through historical science, we consider things that happened in the past, but they cannot be checked in the same way. So, for instance, when you say that Jesus rose from the dead, we have no physical evidence for that. All we have are the writings of people who were not eyewitnesses to the event, and who wrote at least 30 years after the event. That would be like asking me to write an account of the DuPont Plaza Hotel fire in Puerto Rico in 1987 without the aid of the internet. I wasn't there, so it's not going to be a very good report now, is it? I mean, we don't have access to the past like we do the present because, well, it's gone, right? Right. All we really have is speculation, or at best, circumstantial evidences of past events based on what we see in the present. Call me pedantic, but this drives me nuts. Evidence does not get an S on the end. Evidence is what's known as an uncountable noun. It's like luggage or water. You don't put an S on the end of it. So go take out your garbages, eat some rices, drink some milks, and to address your actual point, evidence of past events based on what we can see in the present can be very convincing, especially when you have multiple fields of science that use completely different and demonstrably reliable methods to come to the same conclusions, as is the case with the age of the Earth and the universe. That's not to say that we can't make intelligent guesses about the past or form reasonable inferences from rocks or fossils in the present, but we certainly cannot directly test our conclusions because we cannot repeat the past. You don't need to repeat an actual event in order to demonstrate that the event occurred. 
If I find a human footprint in wet mud, I can be reasonably certain that a human stepped there since the last heavy rainfall. I can also use the footprint to calculate the size of the person who made it. And if there's a whole series of prints, I can use the distances and positions between them to determine if the person was walking, jogging, or running. And even to find out more abstract concepts, like if they were certain of their direction or if they were unsure. All of these are past events that can be measured with present evidence, and measurements of evidence just like this are regularly used to put criminals behind bars without the need of eyewitnesses. Got it? So, does that mean historical science is unimportant? Not at all. Let's drop an example down here for a minute and take a look at the Eiffel Tower. You know, that 19th century Parisian monument designed by Gustave Eiffel that stands 1,063 feet tall, which was built as the entrance for the 1889 World's Fair and is still the tallest building in Paris today visited by millions of people each year? Yeah, that one. Well, guess what? Everything I just told you is true, but how do we test it? We can measure most of it, like height and how many people visit each year. For the rest, we have record keeping, and something that was done reasonably well when it was built, and there are newspaper articles to corroborate the official records. But yeah, when talking about events in human history being recorded by human beings, there will probably be embellishments occasionally, and in some cases those can add up to some quite ludicrous ideas. The Eiffel Tower is still here, though, so we can at least know that it exists, and it is then reasonable to assume that the dozens of sources saying it was designed by the same guy and built the same year are accurate in those details. It is possible that Gustav Eiffel had a designer locked in his basement that nobody ever found out about and he just stole his ideas, but that's not very likely, and there is no evidence for it, so we don't assert it. Well, applying observational science, we can, of course, observe the Eiffel Tower anytime we're in Paris. It's here in the present. Then, we can continue by testing the height and comparing it to all the other structures in Paris and confirm the claim that it is indeed the tallest building in Paris. But that's the extent of the kind of facts that can be proved by observational science in reference to this claim. How do we really know that Gustav designed it? How do we really know it was built in the 19th century as an entrance to the 1889 World's Fair? How do we really know how many people visited? That's all in the past. Well, as I pointed out, when you have multiple reliable sources saying the exact same thing, it is reasonable then to conclude that they are accurate. But that has nothing to do with the age of the Earth. That is done with measurements and calculations that are not subject to human whims and can be checked by other scientists to ensure accuracy. There is always a measure of doubt when discussing human history because we know the nature of human beings. A conquering army will usually try to paint themselves as liberators bringing civilization to the savages, but those savages probably see themselves as being brutally oppressed. It can't be repeated. For that kind of information, we need to go outside the limits of observational science and discover what has been communicated to us through historical documents and eyewitness accounts. And yep, but that's called history, not historical science. There is a science to history, which is how we determine which documents are authentic and where the exaggerations and sometimes downright lies are, but that is completely separate from anything involving cosmic origins. And furthermore, we have to believe those eyewitnesses and documents are trustworthy. The same is true when we talk about the origin of the Earth. Uh, nope, that's not true at all. We have those repeatable, testable experiments and calculations that you keep mentioning to demonstrate that. The Earth is here. We all agree with that. So, does observational science confirm that the world was created by God, and are there trustworthy documents and eyewitness accounts that confirm it? Oh my god, you're right! The Bhagavad Gita was right all along! Praise be to Krishna! <laughs> Well, let's take the last part first. In short, what we're really asking is my original question. Was anybody there to observe it? If your God exists, then yes. What evidence do you have for your God? Is it the Bible, which is demonstrably wrong on so many of its points? It's the Bible, isn't it? The answer is yes. God was there, and he told us how he created. He inspired people to write down his very words that became books that were compiled into a complete book called the Bible. There it is, folks. God is real because it says so in the Bible. And what evidence do you have that the Bible is actually the Word of God? By your own admission right there, it was written by human beings who were not there. Were you there to see that the authors of the Bible were actually talking to God? How can you demonstrate that? How do you know that the Quran isn't the completed book with God having given his final revelation to Muhammad? 
Islam agrees with your creation story. They even say it's the same God. And what about the Hindu Vedas? The Rig Veda was written sometime between 1700 and 1100 BCE, making it not only one of the oldest known religious texts, but the oldest one still in use today. The oldest book of the Bible is most likely Job, and it was written about a thousand years after the Rig Veda. So if there was an original revelation about how the universe was created, obviously the Rig Veda was closer to the source and less likely to have been influenced by the telephone game. ...which has been verified over and over again, and has demonstrated itself to be totally trustworthy in all it claims and teaches. So it's totally trustworthy when it says I can get a new wife by raping a virgin and paying her dad? And it's also trustworthy when it says that Judas threw down the pieces of silver, then hanged himself in Matthew. But in Acts, it says that he used the coins to buy the field and then fell headlong and burst open. And in, uh, again in Matthew, when the disciples saw the angel declaring Jesus to be risen, they told the other disciples. But in Mark, they told nobody. Is that trustworthy? The Bible can't even bother to be internally consistent, much less have outside sources verify it. How on earth is that a trustworthy source? I'll leave a link to a list of inconsistencies in the Bible down below. There are way too many for me to cover here. Long story short, that statement is an outright lie, and the evidence that it is a lie is right in the Bible itself. Even secular scholars will concede that the Bible accurately records historical events. Yes, the Bible has accurately recorded some historical events on occasion. That being said, there are so many inaccurate records of historical events in the Bible that it's not exactly the go-to source for historians. For instance, it's largely thought that the census referred to at Jesus' birth was the census of Quirinius in 6 CE. But there is actually no census that fits with the biblical account. No Roman census ever required people to travel to the birthplace of their ancient ancestors. There was no empire-wide census under Augustus, as it is claimed in the Bible. And uh, the census of Quirinius would not have affected people living in Galilee, as Joseph and Mary were. And uh, Herod, who was supposed to have been king of Judea when the census took place, uh, died in 4 BCE, which was 9 or 10 years before the census, depending on how you count it. Wikipedia says 10, and since Wikipedia is always 100% accurate about everything, that's what I'm going with. So basically, my point here is that this is one of the most significant events in the Bible, and the inerrant word of God couldn't get it right. So why would I trust a book that can't get well-documented historical events right when it makes claims about cosmology, which some of the smartest people today are only just beginning to understand? Anyway, we have the most trustworthy revelation from the most trustworthy eyewitness. <laughs> rich. That's rich. You almost killed me. Oh. Now, what about observational science? Does it confirm the Bible? Yes. Yes. I can confirm by looking at my Bible that the Bible does in fact exist. And what's extremely important to realize is the observable fact that the universe is logical and orderly. And why would you expect the universe to be different without a God? I just don't see how being able to describe nature with math automatically means God to you. I just don't get that. That makes sense only if its creator is logical and has imposed order on his creation. And since God can be demonstrated by a literal reading of the Bible to not be logical, this logical universe is evidence against him. I mean, come on, he knows everything and is all-powerful, but still makes mistakes that are bad enough that require him to kill most of his creation off with a flood in order to do a hard reset? If you're willing to admit that your God is not all-powerful and not all-knowing, then he becomes a bit more feasible. Not much, mind you, but a bit. It doesn't make sense at all if the universe is just an accident of a huge explosion. Expansion, not explosion. And just because we don't know what caused it doesn't mean the answer is God. I mean, that's how we got Thor for lightning, Ceres for fertility, and Vulcan for fire, amongst others. Are you saying you want to add Yahweh to the Pantheon as a god of spatial expansion? Also, our minds are able to comprehend many things about the universe, and that's only possible if the creator of the mind gave us the ability and desire to explore the universe. Or, you would know, if that mind evolved in the universe where understanding the universe helped with survival. I covered that in a bit more detail in my Argument from Reason video with David Wood. Link down below. It doesn't make sense if our brains are byproducts of chance because we couldn't trust their conclusions to ever be accurate. Can you please demonstrate that? How exactly would you know that you can't trust our brains to derive accurate conclusions from observing the world around them based on whether or not your sky wizard designed it? That's kind of like saying you should never eat wild strawberries because you can't trust them as a food source because they weren't planted there by a thinking person. 
No, you can still eat the strawberries, but they might not be as big and juicy as if they were cared for by a person. Just like you would expect our brains and bodies to have far fewer flaws than they do if they were designed by an all-powerful, all-knowing wizard. And lastly, it only makes sense that we can observe and repeat an experiment if the universe consistently obeys the same laws from day to day. Which it most certainly would not if your creationism hypothesis were correct. In order for the universe to be as we observe it today, and to have just been created 6,000 years ago, the speed of light would have had to have changed at some point to allow us to see galaxies that are more than 13 billion light years away. Also, the decay rates of several different isotopes would have had to have changed at some point. The way dead bodies behave in water would have had to have been vastly different during Noah's flood in order to leave the perfect geologic column that we have today. Oh, forget the dead bodies. The way sediment acts in water would have had to be completely different. If we're taking the Bible literally, the motions of the planets and the sun would, at one point, have had to have changed in such a way as to allow it to look like the sun was staying in one place in the sky for a full day. In other words, if you believe that the universe behaves in a consistent manner, creationism is not for you. Which only makes sense if a lawgiver created it that way and upholds it. Why? As I just pointed out, the lawgiver that you are claiming quite often fucks with reality just to mess with people and refuses to do it in a way that demonstrates himself to be real. So to be bluntly honest, science itself, whether observational or historical, is only possible because God exists and the Bible is true. <laughs> yeah, science is only possible because the guy who routinely changes the laws of the universe is there to make sure everything remains unchanging. Right. I could go on, but enough said. As could I. But since you ended the video, I'll end mine as well. So uh, feel free to follow me on Twitter and support me on Patreon. Until next time, this is Vice Rhino signing off.